deregulate, which is basically telling from the executive branch everybody to look the other way. Companies now do testing themselves and report their findings to the government. The process is voluntary. If we started really asking the right questions, we would stop this technology for the next 50 or 100 years. But just the opposite has happened. In the US alone, genetically modified canola, corn, cotton, and soybeans, which were non-existent in the 1980s, were grown on 3.7 million acres in 1996. That jumped to 100 million acres in 2003. In 1998, Mexico banned the planting of genetically engineered corn to protect their agricultural heritage. In Mexico, there are literally hundreds of varieties of corn. Some of them are adapted to very wet uh, climates, some to very dry climates. Some of them are resistant to certain specific pests. Some of them have different tastes. Some of them are good for doing popcorn that was invented by the Aztecs. Some varieties are good to make tortillas or to feed the cattle. There's a whole bunch of kinds of corn in Mexico. Around 7,000 years ago, the people who lived in Mexico started domesticating maize, or corn, and an intimate relationship developed between humans and the plant. Corn is not only their food supply, it is also part of the culture. In the mountains in Jalisco, the farmers plant on purpose their cornfields near areas where the wild corn grows, the teosintle. Uh, and the reason why they do that is because they know perfectly well that they get resistance to pests uh, transferred from the wild strain into the cultivated strain. We don't know which parts of that diversity are going to be useful, and we need to preserve them all. Now, most of the diversity for crops is contained within so-called land races. These are the uh, plants that small farmers generally in very diverse areas of the world, maintained in very small plots with selection for the very specific conditions of the plots, which might be certain altitude, frost or drought, or very specific conditions. That is really the basis of diversity that we are continuously tapping from to maintain our commercial production of crops to feed the world, basically. The 1970 corn blight in the United States destroyed millions of acres of corn. The U.S. was lucky to find a strain of land race corn, originally from Mexico, that could resist the blight. In the year 2000, Dr. Chapella discovered genetically modified corn growing in this remote area. The Campesino farmers had bought kernels of unlabeled American GM corn from their local government store to eat. And as farmers have done for thousands of years, they ate some and planted some. Farmers make no difference between seed and grain for the obvious reason that grains are seeds and are viable seeds. They have a little embryo. They, are, they have the little baby inside the seed, and if you put it in the ground, it will germinate. The genetically modified seed crossed with the land race corn, and contamination entered the gene line of this ancient grain. Ese maíz se come, se, sí. se, se, se está vendiendo a toda la población y en todo México, supongo. Porque no saben en realidad qué, qué no, consecuencias pues es que puede es, tener. Es, es un maíz este, para consumo humano. Entonces, ¿cómo va a ser malo, no? It is cheaper for Mexicans to buy imported corn from the United States than it is to grow it themselves. This is because American corn is subsidized by the taxpayers, whereas Mexican corn is not subsidized. Nevertheless, many Mexicans prefer to grow their native corn varieties.
económico, pues no tenemos que correr a la Conazú para comprarlo. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Sin embargo, estamos comiendo, nos, según nosotros estamos comiendo lo mejor, porque es un maíz que... ¿Todo eso? Sí. Es que el trabajo que ustedes hacen aquí es un trabajo que reditúa, pero para el mundo. Sí. The farmers said, if we do have transgenic elements in our corn, is it going to be like our colleague in Canada? Will the multinational companies come and, and demand payment for the presence of the gene? In November 2001, Dr. Chapella published a peer-reviewed paper in the science journal Nature revealing the GMO contamination. We took this very seriously from the beginning. And we have been doing studies and collecting samples and sending them around, trying first to duplicate uh, Ignacio Chapela's results, which we did, and now going a step further and identify this problem. This is an issue that is a bit contentious because we didn't want to in any way jeopardize our genetic heritage. The first thing is we didn't want that to happen. Whether that is going to have other consequences, well, that's a matter of debate. The fact is, those sequences were not supposed to be in those corns, and they are now. And that's, that's a big problem for us. What happens when you introduce into these areas a single genotype? the one industrial crop that preferentially passes its genes into the progeny. Uh, what happens is basically you crowd out that diversity. And this in the long term is a major threat to food security. Uh, not only for those people who live there, but also for us, also for our industrial production of food. If we do not have access to those genetic resources, we're going to be facing challenges that we are not going to be able to solve. It is not just genetically modified corn that has raised patenting issues in Mexico. Current international system of patents does not protect in any way traditional knowledge, and we have had a number of problems in Mexico related to that. I think there are three or four applications for patents for tortillas, like, that, like it was a new thing, like somebody had invented tortillas, which of course have existed for 3,000, 5,000 years, we don't know. First of all, some people will debate, and I think it is a worthwhile debate, if life should be patented at all. And that's a discussion that humanity as a species hasn't done properly. And it is a sort of pending homework, something we need to do. By the year 2003, the U.S. had sold millions of pounds of GMO corn to Mexico for less than the cost of growing it.
around the world, resistance was mounting against the U.S. exported genetically modified crops. The loss of corn exports to Europe is worth around $300 million a year. This has only compounded the farm crisis in North America. On the one side of the farmer, there's uh, the oil and natural gas companies and fertilizer companies, seed and chemical and machinery companies and banks. And then the farmer is literally in the middle of an agri-food chain. Downstream, there's uh, processors, railways, grain companies, restaurants, packers, etc. And uh, what's happened in that chain is each link with the exception of the farm link, is being dominated by fewer and fewer larger and larger corporations. Those huge corporations that face little competition are able to extract extremely large revenues and profits out of that chain and leave very little for the family farmers. And what the family farmers do get is quickly snatched away by uh, chemical and seed and, and fertilizer companies who themselves have tremendous market power. Farmers are not the ones making the money. There's money being made on both sides of the farmers, but not the farmers. When you put a dollar and a half on the counter for a loaf of bread, that money then moves through the hands of the retailer. And these are $10 billion corporations with only one or two competitors. And the, uh, the miller that makes the flour can do the same thing. The grain company that, that sourced the grain. And by the time it gets back to the farm, there's only a nickel left. And of that nickel, you've got those powerful input suppliers on the other side who can take that nickel right out of the farmer's pocket. I just did a, a study of the economic costs and benefits of BT corn. The official USDA statistics show that the cost of producing a bushel of corn is about $3.20 or $3.40, and the net net return to the you know farmers may be $2.20. So they're losing a dollar on every bushel. And one might ask, well, how is a businessman, if you're losing a dollar on every unit that you sell and you're growing 140 per acre, so you're losing like, you know, $140 an acre, how can you stay in business? And the answer is government subsidies. Subsidies support the most widely grown crops, corn, wheat, cotton, and soybeans. These are the crops that the industry has targeted as the first GMO crops. So if you're an agribusiness company, producing inputs into a market and especially inputs that are going to be more expensive uh, it, it must be reassuring to you to know that regardless of how big the gap is between what the farmers get from the market and what it cost them to produce the government's going to be there to make up that difference in 2002 President Bush signed one of the largest subsidy bills yet although it's certainly not labeled the GMO seed rebate, nonetheless, it's part of what's keeping farmers interested in these costly production systems. This results in every American taxpayer paying a personal subsidy to the agricultural biotech industry. The United States subsidizes its crops. Europe subsidizes its farmers, and Canada and Mexico subsidize neither. Farmers that are producing grain right now are quite clearly losing money on, on every bushel. The prices are below the cost of production. On a lot of farms, families deal with that by uh, one or both, both spouses taking an off-farm job. And the irony is they bring that money back to the farm and use it to pay those input bills. So you literally have the case where small family farmers and their spouses are working off farm and subsidizing Monsanto and uh, chemical companies, fertilizer companies with that money. If you talk to people in agricultural circles about, well, what's the important skill of farming? You know, it's marketing. It's taking full advantage of the government programs. It's dealing well with your banker and all the people that you lease land from and, 